have been pretty quiet on the Marvel front lately, but Disney would never allow things to get too quiet in fear of everybody forgetting about their characters and moving on to the next popular franchise, which I suspect will be a reboot of a reboot of a reboot of the Universal Monster Movie Franchise. <coughs> So here we are with the trailer for Captain Marvel, not to be confused with Captain Marvel who's now Shazam, or Captain Marvel who's a dude, or Jude Law, Dude Law, or Ms. Marvel who was Captain Marvel. Confused? Well you should be, it's nonsense. Let's though get into this trailer including the era that it's set in, origins, returning characters who were previously dead, powers, ties to Infinity War and Avengers 4, and definitely more things if I think of them along the way. And please note I've hidden 10 images of Nick Fury in this video. Can you find them all? There will be no prize. Also potential spoilers for Captain Marvel, but I'm often wrong, so take that. Whichever way you see fit. Right, so there's hints from this trailer that give us a definitive time and place for when and where this movie is set. The car chase sequence we see shows us the sign Lebanon Street, which is located in Los Angeles, California, and I know this because... I found it on Google Maps. However, my search was entirely pointless seeing as the train just flat out says Los Angeles, but I wanted to show you that for no reason I took the time to find it on Google Maps and then screen record a zoom in. Look, it's not important, but here it is, I did it. Welcome to the video, all trailer breakdowns are pointless. As for the time period, well, Blockbuster video was a staple of everybody who grew up in the 90s. Only a 90s kid will recognize a Blockbuster and a graphics calculator and a dial-up modem. Kids now, they don't know what it's like to call someone on a landline. It was a better time then. You know what? It wasn't a better time. I was there, the 90s were horrible, now is much better. Blockbuster video though rebranded to just that of Blockbuster in 1996. Presumably because they were moving towards renting out video games and there was soon to be the introduction of DVDs. It was very forward thinking of them in many ways and then not long after that they rebranded again to going out of business. Which is a very bold strategy. We'll see if it pays off. This map here shows the green line in Los Angeles which opened in August of 1995 meaning this movie is set between then and some point in 1996 when the Blockbuster rebranded brand happened. Captain Marvel, I believe, is the first Marvel movie since Captain America, I'm muscular now, to be set entirely in the past. Barring any flash forwards we might be getting. We've had TV shows that do this, and snippets from movies delving into the time before Tony Stark decided to put on a metal suit and kill whomever he wanted to. So this being set in the 90s was a deliberate choice, and it also lends itself to the type of film Captain Marvel is trying to emulate or homage. Kevin Fieri specifically mentioned Terminator 2 as an inspiration with street level fight scenes and car chases. This movie is also going to have a bunch of space stuff going on because you know there's a lot of space guys in this movie. Space guys. The Star Force unit is comprised of some classic comic book characters which aren't really that classic because they are mostly minor and unknown. But we've got Minerva, a sniper in the film but a doctor in the comics, enemy of Captain Marvel. We've got Bron Char, enemy of Captain Marvel, Atlas. Stop me if you've heard this, enemy of Captain Marvel. Things here may not appear as they appear, but we'll get back to that, don't you worry. Of course having a movie set in the past means you leave the door open for returning characters and this film has a plenty of them. Both Korath and Roman the Accuser from Guardians of the Galaxy are alive and well, completely oblivious to the fact that one of them is going to be incinerated and the other one is going to have a piece of his head torn out. Korath is said to be in his infancy compared to his role in Guardians of the Galaxy, but he's still a humorless machine, it is said. In the comics, Korath was again a member of Star Force, which we again see here, and also a geneticist who experimented on himself to gain powers. Who knows how much of that is going to carry over at all, if any. It's very much unknown at this point. Yeah, comic books. Ronan in this film is pre-breakaway from the Kree Empire Blue Man, which was different when we first saw him in Guardians, and this time around he's a high-ranking member of their society, in addition to being an absolute fanatic about his culture. You probably remember, but he's pretty open about the distaste that he feels regarding the treaty that keeps Xandar safe. He just doesn't shut up about it. So there's a fair chance we'll see some steps towards making that happen in this film. Agent Coulson returns, whom although got his brain poked out till he was alive again and has been running around with a robot hand on Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., he still hasn't been in a Marvel movie since 2012's The Avengers. And that obligatory de-aging technique that's now in every Marvel movie, regardless of whether it needs it or not, will again be at play to shave the ears off. I mean, they said that they're going to de-age him, but I think they just stuck a wig on his head and went, 
Yeah, that's fine. According to Clark, my last name is a first name, Greg. He's a relatively new S.H.I.E.L.D. agent who's obsessed with MC Hammer and dresses just like him. And this in turn makes Nick Fury very angry. Marvel have dabbled in weird dated looks before for characters, usually for comic relief. Who could forget Happy Hogan's Iron Man 3 Pulp Fiction hairdo? It's weird that he would choose this look in 1999. Absolutely nobody was doing this, but I guess the point is that he's an idiot. I gotta say though, I'm very disappointed that Coulson doesn't have a more 90s hairdo. So much so that it's time for a Coulson 90s hair montage! Yeah. Can you feel it, baby? I can too. It's, such a good it's actually a pain in the ass to do all this photoshopping, you know, because you try and get a video out as quickly as you can, and I don't have time for a 90s hair montage, if I'm honest. But just quickly again on Coulson. When he first showed up in Iron Man, he appeared confident and dad-like. He's such a dad, he's like the most dad-looking guy in all these movies. And he had lines like this. What about the whole cover story that it's a bodyguard? He's my body? I mean, is that, that's kind of flimsy, don't you think? This isn't my first rodeo, Mr. Stark. And that rodeo he's referring to, I suspect, and it's also been hinted at, we're going to be seeing in this movie. Captain Marvel, the movie. And of course, we're going to be getting the return of Nick Fury, younger Nick Fury, who's also going to be de-aged 25 years to the Samuel L. Jackson from yesteryear. This is going to be the first time in a Marvel movie that this technology will be implemented for the entire length of a feature film. I think we're pretty much at the point where it won't be too noticeable, because in the past, in some films, it's been very noticeable, and other times, it's not as noticeable. We have been given a bit of background information on this character, namely that he feels his best and most exciting days are behind him with the conclusion of the Cold War. Because as we all know, Russia is no longer a threat on any front and it's definitely safe to divert your eyes away from whatever they're up to and any dealings they may or may not have in relation to the involvement in foreign affairs. This film though aims to take Nick Fury back to a time before all this Marvel madness. A time when he didn't know a gosh darn thing about superheroes. And Carol Danvers is the one who introduces him to this world of superpowered individuals. Which is why I presume he's fairly unimpressed by a drunk in a suit. Should be interesting to get a little bit more of a fleshed out Nick Fury, since the only real information we have on him is this. Nick had ignored my direct order and carried out an unauthorized military operation on foreign soil. He saved the lives of a dozen political officers, including my daughter. So you gave him a promotion. I've never had any cause to regret. And of course, this has already been heavily speculated, but it's probably going to happen, so it's worth mentioning. We're going to see Nick Fury lose his eye, which again ties back to this line from The Winter Soldier. Soldiers trust each other. That's what makes it an army. Not a bunch of guys running around shooting guns. Last time I trusted someone, I lost an eye. Now, since the Skrulls have the ability to shapeshift, there's definitely the chance that either someone he knows is going to be replaced by a Skrull, or someone he knows has always been a Skrull, and then BAM! Eyes to see you, that person will say. But hopefully it'll be a better pun than that, but to be honest, I'd be happy if they used that line, the one that I invented. Now this image of Nick Fury applying pressure to his eye implies that this dead Skrull is the one who took his eye. However, looking at this image, we see at some point he's going to receive an injury above the eye he loses. So I think this might be from that and the losing an eye thing that might come later. It might not even be a foe that takes his eye. He could put his trust in Captain Marvel in pitch battle and she allows him to be injured. Or she punches his eye out, which she is clearly not above doing. That person though taking his eye could very well be Ben Mendo Mendelssohn because we already know he's playing a Skrull spy working as Fury's boss at S.H.I.E.L.D. He's going to be using his native Australian accent when in alien form, which is, look, it's weird for me, I'll be honest. But then he's going to be using an American accent for his human voice. That's acting. You can do two things. Now I'd love to get into details regarding Captain Marvel and her relationship to Jude Law. But there's already a video covering that on my channel. I'll link it at the end of this and below if you want to check it out. Which I suggest you do because it also covers the very odd and confusing history of Captain Marvel. Now like I said, a lot of that video pertains to Captain Marvel, Whom a lot of people, including myself, just presumed that Jude Law was playing. I mean that could very well still be the case. But judging by him being friendly with Ronan, he might actually be Yonrog, the original Captain Marvel's arch nemeses. He's a bit of a big baby and jealous of the accomplishments of others. And if he is Yonrog, this team that consists of just comic book villains 
That makes sense. Yon Rog is also partially responsible for gifting Captain Marvel her powers, as he set off the Psych Magnetron that fuses her physiology with the original Captain Marvel. We see what looks to be a variation on that happening in the film. She's in a flight suit and an explosion, thrown to the ground, crackling with cosmic energy. It's possible that then she's taken by Yon Rog. If it is Yon Rog, then she's brainwashed. He scrambles her memories and has her fight in the Kree Skrull War for the Kree Empire. Here's the thing about the Skrulls though. <laughs> Generally, they are depicted as an evil, imperialistic race. But not all of them are evil. It's possible that we've got it all backwards here, and the Kree are the villains, and the Skrulls are the good guys. Or the slightly better guys. I mean, it's not like the Kree have been shown to be anything else, aside from a pack of blue-skinned alien pricks, with little regard for anyone else outside their race. And who knows, maybe we'll see a bit of, well, some Skrulls are good, and some Kree are bad, and some Skrulls are bad, and others are indifferent, and this Kree is good, and this this one never recycles. Back on Captain Marvel though, that train action sequence I think begins here where she's not lost or bewildered by her location but she's on the hunt, leading her onto a train carriage and then punching an old woman who's probably a shape-shifting Skrull or maybe she just doesn't like the smug look on her face. <laughs> and then she's onto the roof of the train. She's also shown using her powers of shooting blasts of energy from her hands. Captain Marvel possesses a bunch of other abilities, super strength, durability and the like. She's said to be the most powerful hero in the MCU that we've seen so far, but that's all covered in that video I was talking about. But in the comics, she can also fly, which we don't see this version do at all. I mean, she falls from space and hits a blockbuster, and if you were gonna fly and you could fly, that's when you fly. When she fully unlocks the potential of her powers, which it looks like we see in the trailer, we'll probably then get that fight. That could also be around the time of this sequence, where she's squaring off against someone, and she's in the full Captain Marvel getup. Not sure who this is, it's a bit unclear, but it looks like he might be wearing a classic shield outfit. This trailer also gives us the Captain Marvel helmet from the comics, and the Mohawk, the application of which seems to be for a specific underwater sequence. Could be Earth, could be the Kree homeworld of Hala. Just quickly on the helmet though, it has the same force field technology that we in the last Guardians movie. What a fun, fun thing. This is most likely the Kree world of Hala. The Star Force appears to be meeting up here, and we might get an action sequence directly after this, leading Carol Danvers to realize that something's up, and then she flees to Earth, renegading it, as Nick Fury suggests. But before she was shot off into space to fight in a weird alien war, she was some kind of Air Force pilot, maybe even part of some Space Force division. Speaking of space, that moment we see an alien ship arrive at Earth, it's greeted by a smaller vessel. This looks to be an early days shield Quinjet, first introduced in the Avengers. Regardless though of what memories of Captain Marvel are real or fake, they're probably real as her thumbprint unlocks some kind of facility, meaning she definitively has significant ties to some secret Earth government stuff. And I say secret because that's a thumb scanner in the 90s. Sure, there's one on every phone nowadays, but back then, that was the equivalent of having an Atari Jaguar. Ah oh, man, remember the 90s? A lot of things were really crap then. I actually have a really dumb Captain Marvel theory. That is, look, it's really dumb and most likely wrong, and I'm not going to put it here. But if you do want to hear about it, let me know, and I might make something on it later in this week. This person here, though, that's Maria Rambo, friend of Carol Danvers. There might be a significant gap between when Carol Danvers first leaves Earth and then returns, because Maria might then have a daughter, who could actually be Monica Rambo, who goes on to become a Captain Marvel. The planes that they're flying, I've been informed by the Planet Broadcasting Great Mates group. It's a fun and friendly group, you should check it out. Anyways, the consensus seems to be that they're F-15Cs. They were built between 1978 and 1985, which means she probably goes missing in the 80s and then shows up in the 90s. Lastly, this isn't a trailer thing, but this poster also has a nice little Easter egg. In the bottom left corner, shrouded in darkness, we see the back end of a cat. That's probably though not a cat, but a flurkin. An alien that looks exactly like a cat, except it's got all sorts of cosmic powers, like they can store entire universes in their mouths. That's great, I, I guess. This particular one's name is Chewy, named after the famous space dog man of the same name. Man, what a trailer. What a time to be alive, probably. Did I miss anything of note from this? I bet I have. So feel free to let me know in the comments or on Twitter at Mr. Sunday Movies. And did you find all 10 Nick Furies? Just a reminder, there will be no prize. Also, there's videos here every Sunday, Tuesday, and Thursday. And if you like podcasts, which you might, I do one. It's called The Weekly Planet, and it comes out every Monday, where we talk movies and comics and TV shows. I'll link that below along with everything else, as we'll be covering more in-depth stuff from the Captain Marvel trailer in the next episode. You can find all that collated, though, at planetbroadcasting.com. But thanks for watching this. I appreciate it. Take care.